Second, law of contract. Law of contract is mostly taught through a bunch of cases. And in most of these cases, the women who represent, or women, the women, female presence in the case, either they are dead or they are old. The courtesy to one of my friend, Professor Prashant Ayanga, who brought this to my attention. So law of contract also has such a bias that all the English contract laws, women are either dead or they are uh, old. Then constitutional law is a narrative of, uh, uh, a narrative made through the apex court cases. No constitutional law has ever been constructed through the raw sentiments of the masses. It has always been constructed from the perspective of court. Legal reasoning is the analytic of judges. And finally, the students in the law school not only learn all this, they also imbibe a sense of hierarchy, a sense of masculinity, and a disciplinary elitism to which they come to the courtroom. So Duncan Kennedy says that this internalization of a law student needs to be exploded. So we all go to the law school emulating the professors. We all uh, go to the law school uh, with the kind of sterile information or with the kind of monotonous singular information which the professors have provided. Now, the interesting question we need to pose is, um, what is a critique now? Duncan Kennedy says that by becoming critical, critical, you can overcome the hierarchy in the law school and you can construct new identities. Now, what does it mean to be critical? Um, it's a little bit philosophical thing. I would say that we all live in our time and space. Time space is our own projected consciousness. If you feel comfortable in the time and space, we call it, we live in temporal conditions. But sometimes, we feel that the temp we feel untemporal the time and space starts to haunt our own existence so when we feel discomfort when you feel uncomfortable in the in the time space it's time that we need to turn critical so here i would say that critique is an existential crisis it is an untemporality by untemporality i mean you lose the temporal comfort i can quickly illustrate this when i go to a mall i feel very primitive no matter what I'm wearing, what I'm speaking, I feel very primitive because myself is clearly alienated from the opulence and luxury of a mall. But the comfort of sitting in a uh, remote tea stall is much more soothing than the discomfort of a mall. Because in a mall, the time space of a mall is an untemporality for me. And the, uh, and the rural tea shop gives me certain temporal comfort. So probably that I have a primitive self. So. Critique is an existential crisis. When you react to your own untemporality, one becomes critical. Now here, in a classroom, what type of critique? What, what is the untemporality to which we respond? The problem with the law school is that the legal education is very singular. It's very singular. I've mentioned that jurisprudence is the functions of law in, a, law in the society through the eyes of seven white dead men. And the law professors are predominantly male, heterosexual, elitist, patrician. Now, this needs to be broken and the student needs to have plural lenses to look at the functions of law in the society. So first of all, I would say that this is a little bit of radical proposition, but Duncan Kennedy says that students should be given the right to ask the professor of what use you are for us. When a law professor walks into a classroom, the student is asking, who are you? And the professor says that I am a certain voice. Now, here the professor would be literally telling the student, where do I belong? When I say, where do I belong? I mean that there is no law professor, to my knowledge, who doesn't have a dimensional perspective, who he belongs either to the right, to the left, to the center, to the far right, or to the far left. The professors have certain uh, uh, say, say perspectives. If I'm a centrist, if I'm a centrist, I'm confessing my students that I'm going to be a centrist. So automatically, the question comes back. You are a centrist. You have a certain bias. How are we going to get a neutral education from you? So the typical response we give to our students is that I am biased. I have a certain bias, but I'm going to present my bias in the most neutralized fashion. I will not be biased in presenting my biases. Now, when my biases, biases will provoke you, when you will resist to my bias, my bias will find its soulmate. So this is how the critique proceeds. So that a professor, when he walks into a class, can indeed confess that I am a social idealist. I am a Marxist on the, uh, on the far left or I'm a transcendentalist on the extreme far left. So the, 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 the students getting a democratic opportunity to question the professor, who are you? What is the voice which is going to teach us the functions of the law in a society? Once the professor candidly confesses that he has a bias, the students will be able to give counter narratives to the law which the professor has presented. Company law, none of us can imagine learning company law other than through Salomon versus Salomon. 
This has been a conventional narrative that has been fed into our brains that all we can think about company law is through Salomon and Salomon. And uh, when we speak about the legal personality, we can only think in terms of company manifesting as a person. They are all lies. Legal fiction is a lie, a convenient lie. And the liar himself knows that there is a certain utility to the lie. The celebrated American professor Felix Cohen called this transcendental nonsense in legal reasoning. That legal reasoning should not proceed on the basis of legal fictions, myths, and transcendentality. Rather, it should proceed on the basis of pragmatic considerations of the people who are the real audience of the law. Now, second, so one way to explore this myth about the law school or to create a plurality in the law school is by giving the students an opportunity to know which is the voice which is going to address them. Second, to creating courses whereby uh, jurisprudence can be an alternative imagination. In Jindal, we have experimented it. I am the professor of that course. We call it Jurisprudence 2. This is pure critical theory. You learn jurisprudence not through the eyes of the seven white dead men. We are not going to invite them at all. You learn jurisprudence through the eyes of uh, Eric Shapula, who lives in the semi-urban regions of Delhi. We learn it through the eyes of transsexuals, bisexuals, transgenders, uh, religious minorities. We learn it through the eyes of colonial minorities, through the third worldists, and through the most insignificant subject in the elitist discourses. So this theory we, we learn, what we learn as jurisprudence is nothing but a system theory of law. The only anthropogenic presence in jurisprudence is when Austin says that sovereign receives habitual obedience from the masses. Now masses is an indeterminate abstraction. There is no masses, but we would like to learn jurisprudence through the from the perspective of a woman, a third world black woman. We would like to learn jurisprudence from the perspective of a transgender. We would like to learn jurisprudence from the perspective of a commoner, Lakshman's commoner. So this provides alternative imagination. So then uh, there are scholars who have explored these possibilities in jurisprudence. For example, Michael Foucault, Habermas, uh, Hegel, Marx. So you learn jurisprudence through an entirely new perspective. Now one may question, again, I'm naming white men, <laughs> white <laughs> Uh, middle-aged men but again at least they have spoken on behalf of the social subjects so the functions of the law in the society shall not be understood through the systems but they have to be understood through the subjects the proletarian subjects who live in the ground second one is uh, by sensitizing the law students about the gender uh, Saksham committee report uh, the UGC sponsored Saksham committee report has now been circulated among the law schools and Jindal is the first law school to introduce a course on gender and society so that the students are better sensitized about the equality of the gender when they come to practice rather than having a sense of hierarchy which the law school sadistically indoctrinates. Finally uh, clinics uh, the clinics is actually knowledge through the encounters now this helps the students better understand the tyrannies and the oppressions which which is practiced on the people at least may not be direct directly a, a sufferer but at least you are a participant to these encounters when one participates in the clinical courses so duncan kennedy revises the hierarchy from jurisprudence to clinic and he revises it from clinics to back to the jurisprudence and finally a little bit of playful teaching uh, by playful i mean that by teaching and learning the student and the professor gets to know their own inner self this is what I mean by playfulness. So it's an effort to kill all the uh, all the formalities. For example, uh, I teach a course, a playful approach to legal research and writing, in which I asked one of the students to write a bail application for Salman Khan. And I told the student that you have to write the bail application in which you have to project the on-screen qualities of Salman Khan before the judge, rather than the off-screen qualities. Probably that the 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 real Salman Khan, um, the, 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 the on-screen Salman Khan's image, the narrative you're going to give to the judge can eclipse the real crime committed by the Salman Khan, which may render you getting a bail for Salman Khan. This is a sort of playful approach. We are not distorting the decision. We are not distorting with the facts. But it's a little bit of playful, which gives us more sense of engagement and participation and fun in the whole process. Now, um, who is a critic in a courtroom? Because it's all fine to talk about in the law school because law school is a much fertile ground. Uh, students are more responsive, but then court is a more formally uh, uh, protocol environment. So who is a critic in a court? Uh, I just put some random thoughts. Uh, uh, I would love any comments on this. First of all, I would say that courtroom is also a temporality. It's a time space. Now, what is in this time space called a court? The time space called in the court, everybody has a general sense of fairness. We know that when we stand before a court, there is a general sense of fairness. Fairness on the part of the judge, fairness on the part of the lawyers, fairness on the part of the client. If that fairness is lost, courtroom would become untemporal. I'm sure that if any lawyer, any judge gets a sense that somewhere there is a procedural glitch, there is a procedural inertia, 
That very sense is actually the sense of untemporality. But of course, it's easier said, uh, critiquing the court procedure is easier said than done. Here, you don't have the kind of critical imaginations or critical spaces as the classrooms offer. So one way um, uh, for the lawyers and the judges to move forward is to be skeptical. Uh, by, by skeptical, I mean the art of questioning. Uh, one can be skeptical. So classrooms did teach the students how to become skeptics. So when such critically oriented students who have a skeptical culture comes to the courtroom, they can skeptically approach the form and substance of the law. Now, you may, you may ask me, why should you question the form and substance of law? I would say that if somebody wants to present law as unconventional uh, narrative, say for instance, I'm arguing that I'm not relying on the rule before the court, but this is what has been practiced by the culture practiced as culture of the people. Now, whether the court can take cognizance of culture as law or not. Now, ICJ has done it. International Court of Justice had such transcendental moments whereby Justice Viramandri, when he was propounding the sustainable development doctrine, said that I say sustainable development is a law, not because it's codified in any treaty or codified or, or it's a custom, but it is it has been practiced as a culture by the people. So culture automatically became the substance of the law, also the form of the law. Uh, of course, I understand that in a domestic court, which is protocol, formal, there is no such space for a, a counter imagination. But I would say that whenever a judge or a lawyer feels a procedural Immediately, immediately the critique in them arises because the very discomfort one would feel with that procedural inanity is what I mean by the critical imagination in a in a courtroom. Second, courtroom third, courtrooms can take a bit epistemolic approach that the courts are not really spaces to settle the disputes, which is which which in fact is the case, but courts are also spaces for the law to form. That's where the real law is made because here are the masterminds at work from which the law evolves. So that epistemological approach would uh, would provide would fuel the judges to have new imagination and also the lawyers to uh, su submit new imaginations before the judges. So I would say that the court as a site of lawmaking and legal brainstorming would provide critical opportunities in the court. Now, another one is um, uh, uh, that some, some radical arguments that can the court uh, contextualize a decision in the social political setup. Uh, Supreme Court has of late been showing this kind of a trend, especially in the case of Nandini Sundar versus State of Chhattisgarh. This is a case about the private police and the Maoists in the Chhattisgarh. But if anybody who has read the judgment, 24 pages are, uh, there is a 24 pages prologumena by the judges and in which they clearly contextualizes the whole problem of the military junta and the, uh, and, and the Ma Maoism, uh, the, sorry, the nationalism in uh, the, the neoliberal, uh, e as a neoliberal evil. Now here, the thing is, the a layman who reads the judgment get a larger sense rather than getting caught up in the legalacy, in the legal jargons, he gets to understand where this law is, where it is contextualized. So one option is, of course, the, the, the contextualizing the judgment uh, in a socio-political milieu. And finally, uh, the court creating what I would call the Habermasian public space. Public space is a place where people can debate and decide on what are the norms will ha that will have to be binding on them. Now here, when the judges and the lawyers who are non-entities to a dispute, uh, I mean, at least the, the norms which they will create will not be binding on them. The norms which they will be creating will be binding on the people. Now, can the judges and the lawyers be really participants in the norm making. Of course, Habermas has created an intellectual framework whereby he says that they can participate as consociates. Consociate is a critic. Critic who tries to understand, who, who doesn't make an imagination from a perspective from, the, from what is provided in the rules and in the statute book, but rather they try to understand what shall be the law, what shall be the outcome from the perspective of the people on whom that specific judgment is going to make, uh, going to have an impact. Well, this is a very larger theoretical framework that cannot be presented just in one session. Now, finally, um, uh, crit critical renewalism in the court. So I've asked this question, can court apply a law that has a critical or a counter imagination? ICJ has shown this radicalism of applying culture or accepting culture as a law. Um, another one is, is there a room for a critical left in the court? I would say a legal left, somebody who believes that law ought not to be in the rule form, but rather law should come in the form of um, an inner guidance, an ontological guidance. It should come in the form of culture. It should come in the form of ethics and other values, whether uh, they have space, space in the court or not. I would say that there are always some soft paddings in the procedure. When I say soft paddings, there is ample critical space in some of the court procedures. For example, whenever the judge has to decide on an extenuating circumstance, extenuating circumstances, such a vast critical space for the judge and the lawyer. 
Second is discretion. Wherever discretionary powers are allowed, there is space for critical imagination there. Um, so in most of the, these are like the, the space for auto critiquing the procedure, whether the procedure is of a collective help for the clients as well as the lawyers or not, uh, cl clients as well as the, the judiciary or not. Finally, uh, this is a radical proposition, legal and non-legal academic writings become a source of interpretation. Academic and non-legal. I've mentioned that why academic writings here because academic writings have literally museumized the occurrence. They have not only captured a case, they have also contextualized the case. They have provided a plural perspective to a case. ICJ has it. Article 38.1D of the statute of ICJ says that writings of highly qualified publicists can be uh, a source of law for the international court. So this is possible only when the judges and lawyers are open to the leftist writings in the law, the writings like Duncan Kennedy's. Finally, what we mainly require is an openness and willingness that law is not singular, procedures are not singular, but there is always an otherness to that. And we need to create a dialectic, we need to enter into a dialectic relationship with the singular self of the law and with the dialectic other. Finally, um, there needs to be, as I've mentioned, exposure to the unconventional writings in the law. Uh, there are journals like Unbound, Harvard Journal of the Legal Left, No Foundations, Journal Jurisprudence. These are some of the radical journals whereby extreme imaginations on the governance, extreme imaginations of the ro role of law in the society are put forward. And finally, what we need is a manifesto for change. Now, who will write the manifesto? Certainly, this is not going to be an academic work. This manifesto will not be written, if at all, by a law professor. This has to be a postmarian SQ. I've mentioned that in United States, the major transformation in the legal reasoning was brought by a judge, Richard Posner, in his book, Overcoming the Law. So when Richard Posner introduced the law and economics thought, law school welcomed it with both hands. So in fact, the, trans the, the transition there, the transition from normative reasoning to uh, analytical reasoning happened from the judiciary, which moved down to the academia, not that the academia was helping uh, the judiciary here. So what we need is a manifesto, so a clarion call that, uh, I mean, the intellectuals of the world, no matter, uh, I mean, legal intellectuals of the world, what we need is, uh, uh, what we need is a radical change. We have nothing to lose but our own ignorance. So with that words, I conclude. Uh, this was just a very quick capture of the leftist perspective to law. So I hope I've thrown sufficient light into this. If you have any further questions, I'll be glad to answer. Thank you.